Venerable Master, Venerable Ajahn Sumedho, Venerable members of the Sangha, Dharma friends, Omi Tofo, Shi Fu Shangren, Sumedho Fashi, Goei Tong San Daoyo, Goei Pongyo, Daja Omi Tofo. All of you who would like to hear a translation into Mandarin have your headsets, is that correct? Yao Ting Zhong Guo Hwater and Douyo RG, Shi Shi. Yes, is that a yes? I'm not hearing anything. We um, wanted to maximize the time that uh, Ajahn Sumedho uh, has to speak with us, so we thought to have simultaneous translation. So everyone who needs a headphone, Alan is providing them here. All right, and we have a simultaneous translation. So uh, our venerable, uh, Role model in cultivation, Ajahn Sumedho, can speak without interruption. So uh, my name is Hung Shur, and I get the opportunity to do a very short introduction here. And uh, I think uh, many of us have uh, histories and cherished memories with uh, Longpur Sumedho, with our, our venerable Dharma friend, Dharma brother and good advisor. But I'm going to just give a short uh, personal reflection and uh, the details of his life I think are well known they're on the programs and the advertisements that have been going around but I just wanted to say uh, something about how deep the affinities um, with the city of 10,000 Buddhas and with Master Shrenhua uh, are our, our Dharma friend today our guest um, and family member in 1980 uh, I had returned from pilgrimage. Uh, it took two and a half years to get here and uh, had been arrived and was bowing. And it was time for the winter Chan retreat, our annual meditation retreat that we do uh, in silence for, for three weeks. And at one point in the, in the winter Chan retreat, uh, Master Shrenhua, our, our founder here and, and our, our uh, venerable abbot, said, uh, come over here. He said to me, I want you to meet someone. And I walked over, and there was this very tall, and I have to say rather stern looking American monk. He looked no nonsense. He looked like someone who had actually, in, in the language that we would use, someone who had actually resolved his mind on cultivation of the way. Someone who's, for whom bodhicitta was a reality. And Master Hua said, this is Ajahn Sumedho, he said. He has been through a famine in India and survived. He has walked all over Thailand. He's an American who has resolved to leave home and cultivate long before you even heard of the Dharma, he said, speaking to me personally. He said, you should bow to him and take him as your role model in cultivation, he said. So how important was uh, that image given to me of the American monastic Sangha already taking roots in Western soil. So that was my first introduction to Ajahn Sumedho. And another image that I wanted to share with everyone was uh, when our teacher, uh, Venerable Master Shrenhua, was uh, in the last days uh, in this body and was on his his way to uh, entering nirvana not long, I got the message that um, I should find out if Ajahn Sumedho was in the country. And so I made a few phone calls. I think I called uh, uh, Ajahn Amaro was in San Francisco at the time. Uh, Amaravati didn't exist at that point, um, or Abhayagiri didn't exist at that point. So I called and they said, yes, in fact, Ajahn Sumedho is here, he's visiting. So I said, would it be possible for him to come with me down to Los Angeles and uh, pay a visit on Master Hua? And so I was able to communicate that to Ajahn Sumedho, and uh, he said, yes, I would. I would like to go. And uh, so we went down on the Southwest Airlines, myself and Ajahn Sumedho, uh, down to uh, West Covina and to where Master Shenhua was there. And uh, 
they exchanged some, some pleasantries and affirmed that in past lives, they had been what in Chinese are called Tong San Dao Yo, uh, fellow cultivators on the path in past lives and how they knew each other. And uh, Master Hua said, I understand that uh, Ajahn Amaro and yourself have been looking for a suitable home for the Thai Forest Sangha in America. Ajahn Sumedho said, yes. yes. And Master Hua said, well, we have a piece of a mountainside. It's pretty rugged. It's suitable only for monks. And I wonder whether you would accept that as your new home. And Ajahn Sumedho said, why, yes, we would, he said. And that was the uh, uh, official beginning of what is now Abai Giri. So those are some very deep and personal memories that I have regarding our, as they say, venerable father, Longpur Sumedho. And I would like to invite him now to share his Dharma wisdom with us, please. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambutasa. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambutasa. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambutasa. Aparuta de sangamatasa tawaraye suravanta bamunjantu satang. So, with respect to Venerable Hang Shur, Hang Lu, and uh, the Sangha present, lay people, it's a real pleasure to revisit City of 10,000 Buddhas. I've been, uh, I've been retired, if monks can retire, uh, and live in Thailand returned to Thailand for the past four years. And uh, there I lived, I lived quite a reclusive life uh, in a forest monastery. So then I promised Ajahn Amro on my 80th birthday I would uh, come to uh, Amravati for the celebration of that event, which will be on the 27th of July in Amravati in, in England. So this, uh, also I'm, since I'll be 80 years old complete by that time, my sister is also 82 years old. I wanted to see her, and she, she lives in Vancouver, Washington. Uh, so I went to visit my sister, went many other places to Canada, and uh, so my traveling days have been, I've been on the road now for over a month. Uh, traveling from one place to another. And then coming to uh, Abayagiri, I particularly wanted to visit Tanajan Pasun No and the monks, uh, his disciples at Abayagiri, and also because uh, I particularly wanted to visit City of 10,000 Buddhas, because it's due to the generosity of the great Master Zhuanhua that and Bayagiri has been established. Without that, uh, it wouldn't be here. And uh, I've always felt this strong connection of uh, different traditions, from the Thai forest tradition to the Chinese Mahayana tradition. Uh, in the world now, there's like uh, in England, for example, where I lived many years, uh, there's every representative, almost, of every Buddhist tradition that you can possibly conceive of, uh, as well as modern interpretations, psychotherapy, Buddhist psychotherapy, and, and New Age uh, adaptations to Buddhist teaching. 
So it's a very impressive time to see the, the interest in this very ancient teaching. Uh, people often wonder why, you know, an ancient religion, what has it to offer a modern industrial, technological, affluent society? Why, why suddenly this interest in countries like in the United States, why was there suddenly this great interest in Buddhism? And I've been very much a part of that since uh, uh, the since it's uh, since 1955. I think I became interested in Zen Buddhism as I was in the in the U.S. Navy at the time, and, and we were I was on a ship that would sail between San Francisco and Japan. It was through this very beginning stage of just what was available in English language about Zen Buddhism. And, of course, it did offer uh, a challenge to the, to the mind because, uh, of speaking for myself, I've been brought up in a very kind of ordinary, middle-class Christian family in the United States with a mindset, uh, the conditioned thoughts are very much arranged in a certain way uh, in that particular cultural uh, conditioning, in that environment. Uh, and somehow one felt this sense that something, there has to be more than just this rigidity of black and white, heaven and hell, good and bad, and such absolute terminologies. There had, you know, you could sense there had to be more to life than just this dualistic rigidity that was very much uh, my straitjacket, my mental, intellectual straitjacket at the time. And it's sort of an intuitive feeling that had to, there'd be more to life than just identifying everything in terms of good and bad, right and wrong. And of course the initial interests of uh, Zen Buddhism, it started with kind of being fashionable and, and uh, you know, slightly superficial, but it was interesting in the, the beatnik interest, the beat Zen and so forth. It all contributed in so many ways towards an awakening in many of us. <clears throat> so even though we can, uh, you know, criticize the early stages, I've always been incredibly grateful to that beginning because it was a, a transformation, a change in my own life and, and a hope and an interest generated from that uh, first meeting with Zen Buddhism. Now this is my, like I've been uh, a monk now nearly, well, altogether 49 years, and uh, so most of my life has been uh, within the robe. And uh, of course it's been a, truly a wonderful lifetime looking back because uh, having such an occasion and an opportunity to to live my life in such a good way I never really expected it uh, even in my wildest fantasies that my life would uh, be uh, such doors would open for me and such uh, opportunities to understand to practice the Buddha's teaching. And so looking back over these years of life, at 80, you know, you're, you're, on the, you're definitely the old, old man and, and you, you have a lot of memories from your past. And uh, these memories, uh, you know, now generate into a sense of incredible gratitude uh, and joy at the opportunity that I've had uh, to live this life in this very fine way, in interesting way, uh, leading onward towards developing this, uh, a wisdom faculty that in the beginning I had no awareness of at all. But there was this intuitive sense, something in me. I remember when I first came across uh, Zen Buddhism, just reading a few pages of a D.T. Suzuki book, uh, my, my interest, my faith in Buddhism almost 
responded immediately. It was spontaneous. And it, 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 I didn't know why at the time, because I, if you'd have asked me to explain what it was, I wouldn't be able to tell you anything. It was just a feeling or a something or other, because we didn't, have, we didn't have any words or understanding of it on the intellectual level. But it was a, a strong, intuitive uh, breakthrough. That's, at least I found something that was some kind of conventional form that could explain or lead me toward a way of life that uh, I would could respect and that I could actually practice. At first I thought of Buddhism as nearly another kind of interesting religion uh, and um, you know being brought up as a Christian your your attitude towards other religions is dismissal. You know you don't you just kind of dismiss all the other religions and, and uh, believe what you're told about, uh, what the priest says or your parents think. And so that was very much uh, the, the attitude that, that my social background provided me with. But I also recognized that people didn't know anything about Buddhism, Western people, you know, they. They, it's easy to just dismiss it because you, you didn't know what it was about. It's just some strange religion in China that you, you could easily say, well, it's maybe good for them, but <laughs> what has it got to do with my life? But the thing is that the Buddhist teaching, uh, you know, is, is a universal truth. It's not based on cultural conditions. And that's why it resonates at a time like this, in uh, in a country like the United States, uh, highly advanced techno technology, science. Uh, you know, we've developed the democratic institutions and all these worldly uh, conditions based on high-minded thinking, ideals, and so forth, and and clever intellectual exercises and abilities to manipulate phenomena in ways that we can bend it to our will and make it do what we want. But we've not developed wisdom. And so in, in the Buddhist teaching, wisdom then is not uh, an intellectual exercise that you, you just learn wise sayings of the Buddha from the scripture, but you actually uh, emphasize the practice, putting it, making it work, making it real for you. And this is what I found so skillfully uh, done in Thailand with Ajahn Chah, Lung Po Cha. Uh, this was in 1967, I met him. Uh, I'd already ordained as a Samanera and uh, in another place in Thailand and been practicing meditation in a kind of isolated environment, just by myself in a little hut. And then uh, I had a, a very good experience with that to where I realized I needed to take the bhikkhu ordination, higher ordination for the training, to be under an authority, to not just live my life uh, isolated from everyone else, but I had to learn how to integrate this practice into uh, life within a group, the Sangha. So then the I met disciple of Ajahn Chah, and when I became a fully ordained monk, they took me to uh, meet Lung Pa Cha. <clears throat> and during that year as a Samanera, I d developed a lot of insight just reflecting on the uh, initial sermon of the Buddha, the, the Tamajaka Pawatana Sutta, the Four Noble Truths. And uh, during that year, I, I just had this one little book, a uh, little pamphlet from uh, Sri Lanka, uh, the Candy Publishing Society, called Word of the Buddha. And it was uh, a German bhikkhu had, had, uh, had published it and had taken the important teachings from the Tripitaka uh, and put them in this manageable book, you know, it's not very big, but everything that you needed to know in order to put it into practice was there. So I, I had that with me. I didn't take any other books because 
I didn't want to distract myself. I could only read, if I was going to read, I had to read about the Four Noble Truths. And so during that time, you know, I, of course the First Noble Truth is about dukkha or suffering. And so, you know, the, after the initial kind of high of being alone and away from all worldly pressures, you know, that lasted about two or three days, then I was stuck with myself for 24 hours a day uh, for almost a year. Just, you know, they bring me uh, the food, one meal a day. And I couldn't speak the, the language, and nobody could speak English, so I was just dependent on practices, it's what they call in Thai, Kao Hong, where you, you enter a little hut or kuti, and uh, then you're, you're not supposed to go anywhere else, you're supposed to stay there. And you can go outside and do walking meditation, but um, you're, you're not expected to attend meetings or, or anything else. So there I was, you know, this American Samanera novice in this little hut in Northeast Thailand uh, with this one book. Try to imagine what that would be like. <laughs> I didn't have anyone to talk to, uh, no telephone, radio, television, no electricity, nothing. Uh, just a uh, basic hut. But it did, uh, using this, this formula of the Four Noble Truths, this was what I was interested in doing, why I put myself in such a situation, because uh, before, and I lived in Bangkok, I was teaching English at a university there, and then uh, um, I met all the kind of expatriate Buddhists that were available at the time in Bangkok. There were you know, Americans or, or British people who were in Thailand who were interested in Buddhism, and so I'd meet with them and we'd have discussions, and they all had very strong views about who was the best teacher and who isn't any good and I, I, I became totally confused living in Bangkok, listening to the views and opinions of expatriates. So I fled Bangkok, actually ran away uh, and um, didn't tell anybody where I was going. Ended up in Nong Kai, which is, uh, is, uh, is the province that borders on Laos, where, where if you go to Vientiane in Laos, you have to go through Nong Kai. So I was there, I had to go to Laos first in order to renew a visa to re-enter Thailand. And then in Nong Kai, I spent the first punsa, 1966, in this uh, forest monastery. Now what happens, you know, when, you, when your life has been one where you've been constantly uh, distracted, uh, you know, you live a life of you, you read, I was an avid reader of books, um, and had radios and television and all the other things, and so there was a, con con you know, endless opportunities for distraction. Uh, I'd been in university life, I'd been a student in Berkeley, and, you know, one had, developed up to that time and in, in through this uh, this distracting the mind endlessly through available and oftentimes um, interesting exciting pleasant opportunities for distraction and then suddenly you're left alone no friend no teacher even just the word of the Buddha in this little book and then the, the monastery, the monks were all eager to quite support me, the, the nuns were there, so, you know, I, even though I couldn't talk to them, I didn't know what language, you know, they spoke even a dialect, Northeast dialect, so they didn't even speak uh, Thai uh, that you hear in Bangkok. But the aim of the Buddha's teaching is to cultivate this mindfulness. And now in, in I hear in all over the Western world this emphasis on the mindfulness is the 
is the in word, is the word of the day, is the, the word everybody's using. You know, to, they suddenly discover mindfulness as, as, you know, something new, another thing to, to uh, develop or get, get mindful. And so it's uh, quite interesting that, 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 that the time has arrived where suddenly Western world in modern psychology, psychotherapy, I know in London, <clears throat> psychotherapists there that I know are all talking about mindfulness. Where, say, 20 years ago, nobody used, the psychotherapist never used that word. Uh, it wasn't a word uh, the, uh, that they used to describe anything they did. So, uh, now it's the inward. But this is, this is the, the point that the Buddha made, you know, because we, we are caught in the realm of continuous changing condition phenomena. And, uh, you know, we, we have these physical bodies, we have senses, we have eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, we have a, a retentive memory, we have to remember all the things that we did in the past, we have the ability to learn about other things, to study, to, to get university degrees, to learn technology, science, history, you name it. We, the, everything is available now to acquire knowledge from texts from outside. And so we're, you know, we, we've developed that ability to acquire knowledge. It's like our universities, our schools are about acquiring knowledge, about getting to know all about phenomena, different types, which is the best or the worst, right or wrong, the highest, the lowest, uh, whatever. And of course, the, this has uh, made us very much divided in, in how we see each other. We, we depended on, you know, on agreeing on the same views, and if we don't agree, then, then that disagreement creates friction. We have wars, conflicts, uh, contests endlessly about just what this group believe in and what the other group believe in. Now mindfulness then, is, and Pali, the Pali word sati, is, is establishing that awareness present here and now, not something you get, you don't become mindful, you are mindful. It's, a, it's so immediate that, that even a, uh, an attempt to define it kind of is, can be very misleading. The ability to just be attentive to the present moment. And then the sati uh, sampatanya is like uh, ability to apperceive, to embrace all in the, in, one pres in the present. You know, it's not about being mindful particularly of one object that you focus on, but on the totality of this moment. So the sati sampatanya is like mindfulness, intuitive awareness, because I call it intuitive awareness. But it's our ability to, to open to the present moment, uh, which includes everything, uh, you know, that uh, at this moment, and whatever your, your body, your breath, your uh, sensory experience, your emotional state, your uh, memories or whatever, it's not about right or wrong anymore, it's just an inclusive reality of conditioned phenomena changing. And our relationship to that phenomena then is knowing it in terms of what it really is, like just all conditions are impermanent. And so in the Vipassana, the insight practice is all about reflecting, observing impermanence or changing. So in the, in the Pali tradition, we have this continuous repetition of, Sape Sankarani Cha, all conditions are impermanent. Now it's easy enough to understand that intellectually, you know, it doesn't take long to, to kind of agree to that intellectually, but to actually uh, practice that, 
to relate to phenomena that we're experiencing in the present by awareness of its change rather than of its quality or its, whether it's pleasant or painful, uh, you know, exciting or boring or whatever. So changing from somebody who's looking for happiness, excitement, interesting life, uh, entertainment, distraction, uh, running away from boredom or anxiety, worry, fear, uh, running away from anger or greed, lust or th conditions of this nature, we're actually observing them from the position of Buddha or Puto or knowing mindfulness, knowing the nature of conditioned phenomena. So in uh, Lumpur Chars, use this this mantra, the very simple mantra Puto, as a as a way we uh, use uh, develop because it's a two syllable word and it's the actual name of the Buddha, but it's. In Pali, they use it as a uh, in a mantric form, the so puto, and then, but it's the the refuge that we take when we're mindful. We're in that refuge of puto, or the refuge of the Buddha, and that's what mindfulness allows us to be in that refuge. And what is a refuge? But it's always a safe place to be. When you seek refuge, you, you, you know, you're looking for some place you feel secure and safe, and you actually are. You're not trying to, uh, in, with Buddha as a refuge, it's not a, a, a kind of fantasy or a make-believe refuge. It's actually a, the reality of awakened consciousness to the present moment. Uh, there's no refuge that's safer than that. And then in the refuge of Dhamma, Tamo, it's a, like once there's established this knowing, this this mindful apperception of conditioned phenomena, then we we know we actually know Dhamma, not from our views and opinions that we get from books or teachers, but from our own insight, profound understanding into reality, and then Sangho is the is the uh, those practicing Dhamma, those who are actually developing, cultivating the Dhamma, those who practice in the right way directly. <laughs> so when I first ordained in this uh, Theravada tradition, uh, I didn't really know much about it. And, and then I had the Zen introduction that I had, you know, I was very avid reader of Aldous Huxley at the time, when I was a, a student at Berkeley. <laughs> and he actually puts down Theravada Buddhism. Says that they haven't produced any arahants other than the Buddha. And, and that, um, I mean, he, he really produces, vilifies Theravada. So I thought, I'm not going to bother with that. He said, all they do, the monks, Theravada monks do, is try to keep rules. They think, they think that you can just keep rules and become enlightened. So that to someone, you know, graduate student at Berkeley, uh, living at a time where you throw out all the rules, uh, oh, Theravada doesn't sound very interesting. <laughs> it's more, you know, like, I remember in Berkeley at the time, they are always quoting the prophet, okay, he was about, follow your heart wherever it takes you. <laughs> And I saw so many people doing that, and it didn't take you to very good places. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's kind of inspiring, you know, that's what, you, you know, sounds so poetic and, and beautiful, but, you know, we're keeping rules, you know, about, and some of the rules we keep are about all kinds of things that, um, you know, you don't think anyone would make a rule about. So. <laughs> So uh, it's strange, you know, going from the Berkeley scene into this very strict Orthodox Northeast Thai monastery where they, they keep these rules uh, uh, even to the, the smallest detail. But then 
the reason for doing this was because, uh, you know, the experience of living a life, a hedonistic life, just on following your desires, impulses, ideas, and that led, the result was I became a very confused person. At the time I finished my degree, I was totally confused. <laughs> and and uh, also disappointed, like there's a lot of aversion, self-criticism, uh, a kind of aversion to myself. Uh, I didn't like what was happening to me and what I'd become. And so then the, this interest in Buddhism was the only, it was the, like the light at the end of the tunnel. It was the only hope I had, which brought me into Thailand and uh, into the Thai forest tradition. And then I found myself in the very strict form, almost totally opposite to the life I'd been living before. But then, the, the value, this is one thing that modern life doesn't understand about tradition and form. It's, uh, it's like ideals, we, can, we create ideals by thinking in superlative ways, you know, the very best, the purest, the brightest, the, um, you know, and, and we create uh, images of perfection. But life for us is not ideal, is it? It's the way it is. We have to live in a human body that's not an ideal form. It, it born, grows up, gets old, gets sick, dies. And, and so it's, it's this changingness. We have to live in the way, in the world that is continuously changing. That's not ideal. And so, in, in this way, this way of reflection, the Buddha was pointing to the way things are, not to the way things should be. And we can see in, in, in just my lifetime, the uh, American ideal of democracy and, and these wonderful ideals that this country, country establishes itself on, uh, there's so much disappointment because even though it was built on ideals, it's never developed wisdom, understanding of the way things are. And if you only create an ideal in your mind, you're going to be disappointed because none of us can, we're not ideals. We're living, breathing, human, feeling forms. Uh, we're not like beautiful marble statues uh, that can stay that stay beautiful for a long period of time. We have to deal with sickness, with weakness, with grief, and and loss, and and uh, aging, and so forth. And so that's why the Buddha established this basic teaching on the noble truth of suffering or unsatisfactoriness or whatever, you know, the Pali word dukkha is that which uh, you can't bear, that which is disillusioning or unpleasant in our lives. And so the English word suffering is good enough, you get the point. <clears throat> and this suffering then is is raised from a position, because most, you know, we all want happiness, none of us want suffering. We don't. We're looking for happiness, love, security. Uh, we want all the best that we can conceive of. And we don't want old age, sickness, death. Uh, we don't want uh, anything unpleasant. We'd like life to be fair and good, and everybody be honest, and truthful, and dependable, and uh, honorable, everything, the best, the best words, we'd like life to be like that. But um, life is not like that. That's, that's our ability to create images of the best. But Dhamma is about reality, the way things really are, the way it is. And so, in terms of Dhamma, it's not about the best anymore, it's the way things are. And then the Buddha, in his wisdom, pointed directly at the way 
conditions really are. They're changing. And, and over the years in my life as a Buddhist monk and meditator, this, it's putting this into practice continuously. Whatever happens, whether you're, you're loved or hated, praised or blamed, succeed or fail, all the worldly conditions, they're all seen in terms of, instead of, a, you know, on a personal level, um, I like success and I like to be, I don't li I like to be praised, I like to be healthy and strong, I don't want to be blamed for anything, criticized, I don't like being criticized at all, and then uh, I want pleasant, I want life to be fair, and I want to feel that I'm loved and respected. That's the personal, worldly mindset of human beings, most of us. Then in the terms of Dhamma, we're looking at these, these conditions in terms of change, not in terms of personal preference or personal inclination. We're no longer taking it in, in the sense of, of judging our own personal perceptions of the world and ourselves, but looking at them for what they really are. All conditions are changing. And we become more and more aware of change rather than spending our lives looking for the best monastery, the best conditions, the best teacher, uh, the best of everything. And whatever monastery you're in, uh, you can always imagine a, a better one. And so, you know, I know this from experience. <laughs> and and, uh, and no matter how, we might try to establish the best monastery, like Tanajan Pasano has established the best monastery as far as I'm concerned, but how many of you are really satisfied with it? You can imagine a better one, I imagine. Why are you laughing? <laughs> <clears throat> so, this is like the, the awakening of conscious awareness to the realities of the present. Now, in, in uh, Second Noble Truth, you know, why did the Buddha take suffering as a noble truth? since it's what nobody wants. And uh, we all think it's a, we more or less see it as a nasty fact of life. Suffering, what you remember as a little boy, uh, brought up as a Christian, asking my mother, why, why is there pain? Why is there, why did God create pain? <laughs> if I were God, I wouldn't have created pain. <laughs> And so, and I don't know how my mother answered that. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's a good question, isn't it? You know, if, you, if God is all love and, and creates only what's good, why, did, why is there so much of the opposite? Well, in, and now this is a question of a child, you know, a little boy questioning about something you don't want. I don't want physical pain. I don't want to feel hurt or anything like that. But then the Buddha takes this ordinary experience, the very, it's too, you know, it's a, a truth that we all can relate to. It's not high, it's not metaphysical height of, you know, philosophical thinking or anything. It's just banal, ordinary suffering uh, that we experience every day. And then putting it in the category of a noble truth, what's noble about suffering is that we change our attitude towards it from blaming it on others, uh, trying to run away from it, seeking happiness, to looking at it, understanding it. So that's a shift, uh, you know, from a, 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 an un... Uh, awakened person who's just seeking for happiness in the world, which most people are doing, security, they want security, love, want to be loved by somebody, uh, and so forth, they're seeking for 
an exciting life, because life can be incredibly boring, and so forth. So we're thinking for stimulation, for love, for security, for the best. But so much of our life is boring, isn't it? And it, it's routine. It's getting up, putting on your clothes, washing your face, brushing your teeth, waiting for the bus. How much of your life is just waiting for something? And um, now we have, you know, traffic jams. We have to wait in traffic jams. And, and people complain endlessly. And we've got to improve the transport system and so forth, because we, we don't like waiting. We want instant results and so forth. This is dukkha, this is suffering. So changing from one who is always trying to get rid of it, change it for the better, uh, ignore it, to one who understands. To understand something, you have to accept it for what it is. Now, accepting doesn't mean you're ever going to like suffering. It's not something you you are going to ever like, but it's something. But it's a noble truth that leads you onward to the reality of non-suffering, and that's the point of the noble truth. Because the the uh, if you follow that teaching, this was a, a Buddha's first sermon after enlightenment. Uh, it's a perfect teaching, actually because it actually takes something quite ordinary that we can easily see and know in ourselves and instead of, of trying to get rid of it or blame it on blame our misery or unhappiness on somebody else we're, we're understanding. Understanding means to accept it for what it is you're, rather than seeing it in terms of aversion and blame you're looking at this suffering is like this, this feeling of dis-ease. Of, it doesn't have to be extreme, you know, it doesn't have to be some kind of great persecution, being crucified or, or abused by outer forces. It's about just thinking, uh, worrying about anxiety, about all the uh, neuroses of modern life. We're all about dukkha, suffering. And our relationship to them changes towards understanding. And as I said before, understanding means that accepting it is like this. Now, in, in we use this word, it's like this, because we're not describing it or saying it, uh, uh, trying to define it, but recognize this feeling of dis-ease or discomfort or worry or anxiety is like this. And that is mindful of, of a condition that is present. And if you're willing to bear with that condition, allow it to be what it is, you'll, you can actually observe its cessation. Because it is impermanent. Worry is impermanent. Fear is impermanent. Anxiety anger, hatred, jealousy, when well, you name it, all the emotions, everything, all conditioned phenomena is impermanent. And our relationship then is towards observing impermanence rather than trying to hold on to the best and suppress the what we don't like. Now this, this as I said, is a, a cultivation of wisdom and what do we mean in, in this Buddhist sense of wisdom? Because sometimes we don't really know what wisdom is. And uh, in the Pali language, they use the word panya, which means discerning. It's not a critical function. It's not a, like your thinking mind is about criticizing, isn't it? This is bigger, it's comparing one thing with another. This is bigger than that. This is better, this is worse. Wisdom is not about criticism, it's about discerning. And so this ability to discern reality from non-reality, discern anger from non-anger, discern uh, anxiety and non-anxiety, that is where wisdom operates. It's mindfulness, 
with mindfulness, with sati, with sampatanya. And then wisdom is a universal reality. It's not a, it's not a cultural thing. It's not dependent on language. It's available to us all the time, no matter if we're educated or not. It's not something we don't have or we have to get. It's it's available to us every moment if we try if we recognize it. So in Buddhist meditation is the em emphasis on realizing, recognizing Dhamma or reality, awake to reality. So the Bhutto or the Buddha is the is awakened consciousness of an individual to Dhamma, reality. So in English I like to use the word reality for Dhamma. <laughs> in in England, I remember people were saying, were blaming us sometimes, saying, uh, you don't live in the real world. <laughs> I suppose you heard this one. <laughs> Escaping reality. <laughs> and, uh, what do you mean by the real world? You know, And uh, they think we live in, a, in an ivory tower. You know, Amaravati is an ivory tower where we just blissed out on, on ethereal pleasure every moment of the time. <laughs> or, I don't know what they think, but reality is, you know, the real world to many people is just, you know, uh, paying off the mortgage and, and getting a new car and so forth. <laughs> and, you know, the problems of relationship, marital relationships, and, and personal relationships, family problems, social problems, political problems, they're endless, aren't they? Where do where do these ever get resolved, really? Uh, you know, in terms of just uh, you know, we it's usually power struggling or dominance of some sort. Uh, we manage to force our opinion on somebody else or get our own way, or we get frustrated. We take to drink, drugs, or whatever as a way to deal with our dukkha, our suffering that we're experiencing. Or the skillful way that the Buddha recommended is to understand suffering, to, to know, uh, to have insight, let go of the causes of suffering, this ignorance of Dhamma, to let go of, of uh, just the, the blind attachments we have to our appearance, to our bodies, to our emotional habits, to our memories, our perceptions. Because these are all very divisive, you know. We have racial prejudices and religious prejudices and all kinds of prejudices. Why? Because we're blindly attached to perceptions we've acquired. They're not based on wisdom or reality. They're based on, on ignorance, cultural biases, religious biases. And, and so we, we get programmed to see things through these distortions. And then we feel anger, hatred towards those that are not like us or don't believe or have the same uh, belief system that, that we might have. But when we get into Dhamma, that's universal. It's not about culture anymore. It's not about race, gender, or anything else. It's not, a, it's not defined in any condition way. But it's realizable, it's reality. It's, it's not something that, that you lack or have to get, it's just you awaken to it. It's just this. And then if you develop it this way, then you begin to understand the way of non-suffering. And that is like the fourth noble truth based on right understanding of Dhamma, then our cultivation of Dhamma is accurate. Because once we have that insight into the path, into the way of non-suffering, then we cultivate that in our daily life. And this is one of the great gifts of Sangha life and monastic life because it, it's a form to make it easier for us to cultivate this. You know, it's uh, 
and, and it, it, like the strict Vinaya practices uh, uh, in the Thai forest tradition, uh, you know, one can see as, one can criticize from an American liberal mindset. Or, rather than just criticize, you know, it's, it's voluntary. I could, have, I could have left at any time. Nobody was forcing me to stay there. But uh, it was learning how to give up my own personal agendas and views and opinions to live within a structure that I couldn't control or manipulate according to my own views and opinions and wishes. That I found very helpful because it's a tradition, it's not new age philosophy of somebody who just suddenly comes forth and, and has some new ideas. This, is, this, has, this form has managed to survive for over 2,000 years and still is perfectly pure. It's not been corrupted has not been destroyed or in that from the time of the Buddha to the present moment. The teaching of Dhamma is pure, it's never been corrupted. Individual monks can be corrupted, but not the no. <laughs> and, and so and then the form, the Vinaya form, you know, when I first uh, before I went to live in England, for example, uh, I had uh, doubts about how to survive as a Buddhist monk in London. Uh, you know, there, there are not many Buddhists and um, I'm not even English and I've got to live in a huge city, international city, as a Buddhist monk without money or anything, without, we can't even grow our own potatoes or cabbages. You know, we're kind of helpless creatures uh, you know, living in a very sophisticated cosmopolitan city where I don't, you know, I didn't know anyone or any Buddhists there. So I went to Ajahn Chah and said, you know, I don't, I don't know if this is, you know, this is, I don't know how I'm going to survive, you know. It's not a Buddhist country and, um, you know, we can't handle money, we can't, uh, garden or anything? How do we? How do you expect me to survive? And he said, "Are there kind people in England?" And I said, "Well, yes, I'm sure there are." And he said, "Go." And this was quite an insight for me because I realized that Ajahn Chah's attitude towards humanity was that basically we're good and kind. We want to be good and kind. My view from the American conditioning wasn't like that. It was, we're basically selfish and you have to look out for yourself first. If you don't, nobody else will care. That was my take, very cynical, I admit. Uh, and that's, that's how, uh, that's the view I had, you know, brought up in a, in the, in the, with the worth, work ethic, you know, if you are, out there making sure you're secure, then you're going to end up as a homeless failure, which nobody wants, you know. You <laughs> it's a dismal prospect. So you've got to make sure you've got money in the bank, life insurance, health insurance, everything provided. And then uh, Lung Po Chao said, are there kind people in, in England. I said, well, I'm sure there are. And he said, go. And it, it really awakened me to, to a change, you know, to see humanity as having that potential, a goodness, a kindness, a generosity, that before I would, uh, wouldn't have even conceived of. <clears throat> so I did. I went, and I've never had any great problem surviving in, in London or in England or any other place. You know, it's never the, the requisites necessary for a survival of food and robes and so forth are, were in abundance. You know, the, we had too much food. I got overweight there. <laughs> and and uh, abundance of material things, you know. England was the first industrialized country in the world. They have a lot of junk there, you know. And so you don't even have to have modern 
fashionable trends, you, there's so much extra available stuff around. You know, it's not difficult to survive. And then you're in a, a society that's religiously tolerant. Uh, Britain is uh, incredibly tolerant towards other religions. So I never felt uh, looked down on or marginalized as a Buddhist monk living in, even in a city like London. <clears throat> because, uh, you know, we were, the, the government there is trying to include us in, in the system. They're trying to include different religions. So, you know, I've been invited about three times. I've been to Buckingham Palace and all these kind of places you'd never expect to, as a Buddhist monk to be invited to. And, uh, but it's the, the, kind, the generosity and the tolerance of surviving in Britain as a Buddhist monk has never been, that, that part has never been a problem. So today in, in, the, in Britain there is a monastery. Ajahn Amro now has, I've asked him to take on the duties of Amravati. Uh, he was at Abhayagiri for years, helped establish that. Now he's taking on the, this place in England. And he's doing very well because it, it's it's well established, and uh, there's also many Buddhists, many uh, Thai people living in in Sri Lankan uh, from from uh, Asian countries as well as British European. Those who are interested, especially in meditation. So. This, uh, my respect for the Dhamma is, is over the years has increased to 100%. <laughs> <laughs> and I feel, you know, I feel that I have put into practice these Four Noble Truths ad infinitum, you know, just pushing them to everything that ever happens to me, you know. And getting success or failure, praise or blame, using every event of my life, you know, every form of, you know, the tendency, karmic tendency, personal tendency, good or bad, right or wrong, putting it in that context of the noble truths, so that it's like you're from the very refined uh, emotional. Uh, transitional states to to coarse emotions and whatnot it, you're just observing the impermanence of conditioned phenomena and now it just seems so obvious so true you know because it is true it's reality that there's there's no real self all your fears desires your personal views, they're all conditions changing. You're not anything that you think you are. Don't believe what your mind says, it'll lie to you and deceive you endlessly, but trust in the awareness of it. It's not to destroy the mind, but to understand the nature of phenomena in, the, in this characteristic of change. So I offer this as a reflection. We deeply uh, uh, appreciate uh, uh, to say the, the title. Uh, Long Po. <laughs> also, my Uda Upadaya. In 1991, the Venerable Master Hua honored uh, Long Po uh, Vendor Sumedo as uh, the, our Upadaya. That time, we have uh, two chanting party. Well, we, I don't know how that chant. 
uh, we hope you can make a venerable Xu Yun to live 120 years old. <laughs> it's still 40 years to go. <laughs> okay, the Reverend Shi want to give us some conclusion. So, uh, my direct instructions were to follow my role model in the Sangha, and I'd like to just share those with everyone, to, for all of us here, uh, in the city of 10,000 Buddhas, hall of 10,000 Buddhas, to be able to hear our uh, elder monastic Sangha member in the West, Venerable Ajahn Sumedho, is a rare and historic moment uh, for all of us. And as the Dharma comes West, I think it's really significant to point out how uh, the, the as, as our founder said, uh, the, tell the South not to run further towards the South and tell the North to turn around from their direction North and we'll all meet in the middle, he said. So this is the best sign of the Buddha Dharma's coming to the West and planting down good roots. And all of you here are part of that, having heard our instructions from our elder monastic, the Venerable Lung Por Sumedho. So let me, on, if, if you will, on behalf of everyone, express gratitude for this opportunity. And perhaps we could uh, do a brief transference of merit and send it out even further. And I'll, if you all each in your own way would like to uh, oh, I have a better idea. Uh, Ajahn Pasano, would you would you lead us in the the chant of dedication? May the goodness that arises from our practice. Should we do ours? Okay, okay, all right. So, may the goodness that arises. Okay, so he gave it to me. Why not? So. I, let's see, I actually left my guitar, I don't bring my guitar to the city of 10,000 Buddhas. So. How about that? So. But thank you for the invitation. So let's do it without the guitar. If we could put our palms together and each make a wish and send it as far as your mind can reach with whatever goodness you'd like to share. Those of you who know, please, please uh, chant along. May every living being, our minds as one and radiant with light, Share the fruits of peats with hearts of goodness, luminous and bright. If people hear and see how hands and hearts can find in giving unity, may their minds awake to great compassion, wisdom, and to joy. May kindness find reward. May all who sorrow leave their grief and pain. May this boundless light break the darkness of their endless night. Because our hearts are one, this world of pain turns into paradise. May all become compassionate and wise. May all become compassionate and wise. Two, three. Thank you all for coming, and that will conclude this, this afternoon's program. <laughs>